Hello, and welcome to Applied Nostalgia, a podcast that applies post-9-11 thought patterns and analyses onto pre-9-11 television. In other words, Kale and Evan talk about old TV shows. For updates, follow us on Twitter at SoWellRead. That's at S-O-W-E-L-L-R-E-D. So stick around for a few laughs, and you just might learn something along the way. Hello, I am Kale. Hi, I'm Evan. Today is a very special Applied Nostalgia. This is the Trick or Treat episode for Halloween. Ooh, spooky. Ooh. Oh my god, spooky. We're actually recording this in a graveyard near Evan's house. It's fucking crazy, you wouldn't believe it. There's caskets, there's mausoleums, there's ghosts. I saw a bat fly overhead. <gasps> And he said it wasn't a bat, and I was like, that's a bat. He thought it was a bird. I but thought he was it was just a bird. just telling himself that because he's fucking scared. Yeah, I thought it was a bird, like a night bird. I, I heard about those. I had to tell him, there's no such thing as a night bird. Birds sleep. Birds sleep at night. I heard birds like sharks. If they stop flying, they'll die. Well, it's true, but they sleep fly. Is that a skeleton over there? Oh, God. Oh. No. You got to calm down, or we're not going to be able to apply any nostalgia. Then that's the Jesus. one thing we're here for. Damn it. I can't help it. Okay. Did you touch my dick? Or was that a ghost, you think? I, I didn't touch it. Okay. Okay. I'm going to have to keep my uh, eyes peeled. I'm going to keep my pants peeled just to be safe. Yeah, I'm going to take my pants off just to be sure so I'm more sensitive to touches so I can tell what's been touching my dick. I need to know if the creepy crawlies are around, if you know what I mean. <laughs> well, I'm well aware. I've never recorded when we were sitting on top of graves before. You know, doesn't it seem a little bit disrespectful in some ways? I'm sure these guys like TV. If they were alive in the 1900s, they'd watch TV. Oh, yeah, you know what? They probably listen to radio. And what we're doing right now is basically broadcasting a radio from on top of their memorial. We're actually doing them a service, a spooky service. Ooh. I feel suddenly pretty good about all this. Hey, is it getting brighter out, or is it like floating pumpkin oh by my, my God. head? Good, 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 good episode of the show. If we're going to get through this, you're going to have to stop being spooky, because we're already in a graveyard. You don't need any auxiliary spooky. The spooks are inherent in this show. Yeah. We don't need to bring any more of our own spooks. You're Jesus right. Jesus Christ, the moon's already shining up there, down on us, illuminating all the creepy graveyard stuff. Oh, yeah. The wolves are howling at it. Hey, wolves. I can't even believe it. I think there's a car over there that's running by itself. Are you serious? Yeah. I think it's got a girl's name or something. I don't know. Wait, a fucking where, dude? Three o'clock. Well, I mean, a fucking car. That's not even scary. That's like, that's real scary. A car with a fucking running, like, what do you think they're doing, man? I don't know. Do you know? Did you, did you fucking call someone to, to creep me? I didn't call anyone to creep that you. that fucking guy touched my dick? I wouldn't creep you, but I don't know. I didn't do anything. Okay, I'm gonna... Okay, well, I'm gonna chill. Okay. it's probably just, just a dude. Okay, let's put it out of our minds. Take a deep breath. Okay. <sighs> okay, right. I feel good. Hopefully we don't get interrupted. I bet it won't happen. No. I feel like they had their fun, and now they realize we got a job to do. They got a job to do. They're gonna go creep down the street. They got lots of trick-or-treaters to creep on. Uh, you know, you're 100% right, because it's Halloween. I mean, it's the one night a year that they can leave the graveyard, because they're creeps. They can't leave on anything but all Hallow's Eve. I didn't know they passed that bill. That's fucking crazy, man. Yeah, I voted for it, because, I mean, you know, land of the free, right? Was that uh, no on Boo? No, it was actually yes on Boo, I'm sorry. Oh, shit, so I voted against their right to leave their graveyard? Yeah, but in all fairness, it was written poorly, so you might have thought it was, like, against Boo Radley. Oh. And to be fair, like, I did. let that guy stay in his I'm house. Gonna... He's creepy. <laughs> I don't want to get into that. It's Halloween, not fucking civil rights march, not a sit-in. This is a trick-in. Treat. This is a trick-or-treat episode. <laughs> we got two shows for you. One's a trick, one's a treat. Ooh. I think you'll be able to figure out which one's which, because I'll tell you as we get to them. I can't wait. Now let's hope no witches interrupt us, and... No zombies, no Frankensteins, no Herman monsters. 
Oh, I hope not. Okay, let's get to this. For the trick portion, we have a little show that lasted a whole six episodes. Good run. From 1997, it's called Mego. Mm. Today we watched episode 106, entitled Halloween. That's a creative title. Well, it's not creative, but it's uh, it's accurate. It says what it is. I guess that's accurate. what accurate is. It's a good thing. I'll give you the rundown of who's in it. Mego stars Bronson Pinchot, classic actor, Shakespearean trained. He plays Mego. We got Ed Begley Jr., who plays Dr. Edward Parker. We got Michelle Trachtenberg, who plays Maggie Parker. We have Will Estes, who plays Trip Parker, who was formerly in the pilot Eric Von Detten, a.k.a. Brink. As yeah. we all know, we all know and love Brink. Or Clue from um, so, so Weird. weird. So weird that we'd say that at the same time. That's pretty weird. And then also, Jonathan Lipnicki as Alex Parker. And would you like to give us a brief synopsis of what the show's about? Um, so Bronson, but he's an alien. He's from some planet. I don't know what it's called. What is it called? I don't think they said. Or they said, but I didn't <clears throat> care enough to write it And down. Um, he crashes down on Earth, and he meets up with his family, and then... I don't really understand the rest, but I do know that he becomes their maid, and he's going to stay until he, you know, fixes his ship, but then he just likes the family, and he ends up staying. So it's a, it's a little elf-like, but with a person instead of a puppet. It's very elf-like. I don't know, we found it, and it looked like the worst thing ever. It looked really bad. And we watched it, and it was really bad, but not as painfully bad as we had expected. Migo. It should stand for me go away from the TV when this is on. <laughs> yeah. Well, if cave people were watching it, you can probably be sure that's exactly what they thought, even if they didn't say it. This was part of TGIF, produced by Miller Boyette, who are also famous for Step by Step. That's the home run. I mean, they were all shooting for the quality of Step by Step, but they fell a little bit short on me go. They fell pretty short. They fell almost as short as Migo did to his destination that he was trying to initially arrive at, if that makes any sense. It does. Uh, yes. <laughs> so in the first scene, we see Migo walk in to the living room of the house, and he's got a bowl. And he goes, okay, Alex, who's Jonathan Lipnicki, he goes, okay, Alex, I've got the bowl to make us the most popular house on the block. Because everyone wants to be the most popular house on the block. I don't know why you wouldn't want to be the most popular house on the block. If you're in America, you got to be popular. <clears throat> Bronson Pinchot, a.k.a. Migo, a.k.a. The Alien, already knows about popularity. It's great. Well, there's one thing that you learn from watching TV. It's that if you're not popular and people don't like you, you might as well not even fucking live on planet Earth. Get back in your ship and go back to Galaxion. Can you tell me what he had in that bowl? It wasn't candy. Um, oh, okay. <laughs> he had shiitake mushrooms. Yeah. That's fucking crazy. And, and orthopedic um, insoles. And orthopedic, orthopedic insoles. That's fucking funny. It's like he thought kids wanted that stuff. That's exactly, it's just funny that an alien understands an abstract thing like popularity and acceptance, but doesn't understand something as basic as, like... You know, what people desire, like, you know, they want fucking candy, but he's just it's fucking funny. He <laughs> thinks funny, like, it's fucking funny. He's fucking wacky. He sees the world like this weird thing. God, I'm sorry if uh, my mic picked up some of my laughing. But... <laughs> sorry. Sorry, I fucking thought of the mushrooms. Oh, my God, Migo. Yikesies. <sighs> Like, I guess we should have gotten the, the jimmies out before we started recording. I should have fucking thought this through, dude. Man, it's it's just too funny. I mean, he, he gave him shiitake mushrooms. <laughs> Yikes, dude. I just keep thinking of, like, the fucking... He thought it was going to be fucking a candy. <laughs> <laughs> like, could you imagine if you went over to the house and you guys... <laughs> <laughs> Go on. And you Where went you to the door, and you said, trick or treat, and then stuck your candy bag out, <laughs> and he gave you shiitake mushrooms. 
<laughs> oh my god. Oh, fuck. I'm crying a little oh, bit. Oh, shit. Whew. Fuck, I don't want to wake up fucking ghosts. Oh my god. The skeletons are all turning over their graves because oh they're laughing god. so hard. See, this is a service. Oh my god, man. This is a fucking service. They're dead. Oh, okay. Anyway. Okay. Whew. Okay. Whew. Okay. Whew. Settle down. Settle down. So, then we hear a knock on the door. Alex goes over to the door and opens it to reveal a scary man in a wolf mask. And he runs in, attacking Alex. Scares him quite a lot. So when that was happening, did, were you scared like I was? Like, you well, were like, what the fuck is happening? I didn't tell you, but I actually wore an adult diaper for watching this. Oh, I fucking wish I would have had that. I wish you would have, too, because you're on my chair. <laughs> well, you know, it's poopy, but I digress. Wait, so are you saying you pooped yourself instead of peed yourself? <laughs> yes. Wow, that's even scarier than peeing yourself. Well, I just felt scared, because, um... That, he's so little, that little kid, because we should describe what he looks like. Yeah, he's Jonathan Lipnicki, Circa Jerry Maguire. He was uh, tiny. He's maybe two and a half feet tall. He's yeah. got glasses, and he's barely remembering lines. Does he have a condition? He just looked the same until he was, like, 14. That's a condition. That's just called the human experience. The condition we're all afflicted with, or blessed with. That's your choice. I don't want to get all philosophical here. I was very scared. I saw myself as Alex. That's the way yes. they, the creators wanted you to get in the show, through his point of view. Really fucking good job. And I just was like, oh my god, something's coming at me. Well, I just feel like inside, we're all a little bit of like a 2.5 foot person. We all have that, you know, the world a scary place. We all feel like a little weird looking thing. It turns out, mm -hmm. it was just a mask. And it was his brother Trip yep. playing a yep. hilarious prank on him. <laughs> Oh my god. Oh my god. I, I wish I had a brother that would have pranked <laughs> me like this. I don't know if I could deal with it. If I I poop my pants seeing it happen. Yeah, and it was through a computer. I would probably shit and piss and throw up if it really happened to me. Let's be fucking clear here. If I poop just seeing it on TV, I'm going to do the full Monty if it happened in front of me. I think my jaw would have dropped so far. Yep. It would have been on my basement floor. Oh my god. God, dude. And I mean, I didn't open the door in the basement. It dropped through the first oh, floor floor. Shit, dude. You break your fucking jaw. You have to pay for your house. I know. Oh, my God. So, kudos to Jonathan Lipnicki for not having a real heart attack when he was filming that scene. That's crazy, man. That shows his acting skills. Some people who have, like, size differences have, like, weird heart conditions. So, I'm just surprised. They must have had him sign a clearance before they shot that. I'm, I'm sure assuming. they did, yeah. Something like that. Just, yeah. Well, I mean, his parents are probably on set, but they were, like, blindfolded and, like, because they knew it was going to be really scary. You have to. They probably had to be like, okay... Jonathan Lip Nikki, you know, they say their last name to their son. I don't know why it's an ego thing. They probably said, Yeah, today we're gonna be doing scary stuff. Thank God he made it. Amigo goes over to Trip and he says, I'm really disappointed in you. How would you like it if you were scared like that? And Trip says, Oh, you couldn't scare me. And to be fair, Trip's very tough. Oh my god. He's clearly tough. He came in and scared his yeah. two foot brother. Because that is sort of horrible that you do that to your flesh and blood i mean he's got the three ingredients of uh there what is it a certified hottie yeah he's uh hot his hair sexy and hair yeah hot sexy and hair that's how <laughs> i judge every guy <laughs> and they would just assume that there's some superlative like you know attached to the hair part because you don't mention the hair unless it's good or unless there ain't none of it as i was taking notes i actually ticked the boxes i, I wrote hot sexy Hair. Three okay. check marks. Good. I wasn't even sure if he remembered that. Yeah, he checked out. I checked <laughs> checks, him out. Yeah, he's... He, let's just say that um, girls, they don't check their boxes. They just try to put him inside their boxes. That's sex humor, but... I mean, we didn't need to go there, but... I know. It's true. So then Migo decides to use his powers to make the couch into a CGI monster so that it'll eat Trip and scare him. The monster literally yeah, eats him. he eats him. Puts him inside of him. Like, he takes Trip and eats him. He's not visible to the world anymore. And Trip does not have a reaction. He doesn't fucking flinch, you know? He's just reading his magazine, and he goes, Gonna have to do better than that. You're gonna have to do better than this. The look on his face was pretty priceless. It's not so much funny as I, I see him, and I'm like, I want to be like him. All I gotta say is, he is one cool cucumber. Oh, my God. 
He's as straight and narrow as his fucking spiky hair. He should be wearing a leather jacket, even in the shower. Oh, my God. You know, well, someone like him, he walks around, and he's like, you know, back when leather jackets were invented, someone saw him and got the idea for a leather jacket. Yeah, someone saw him and was like, you know what? I could kill an animal, rip its skin off, tan it, sew it together, and put it on this guy. Yeah, and it'd be a trench coat, and originally trench coats of uh, tan leather, it was tall, dark, and handsome. And it's, you know, designed after a man that fit that description. And I mean, yes, we established he's hot, sexy, in his hair, but he's also tall, dark, and handsome. There's a lot of systems to quantify how it, sexy a guy is. It's a three-point system, no matter which way you look yeah, at it. Yeah, I mean, it changes over time, and that's just the one we remember from the 90s. Tall, dark, and handsome is, you know, it goes back, but it's the same idea. Fundamentally, a hot guy is a hot guy. So he's got no reaction to Migo making a monster eat him. And frankly, if you've got no reaction to that, I don't know what's going to get you. Because that's insane. Um, I've never been eaten wholly by a monster before. No. I mean, I've had a few bad dates, don't get me wrong. <laughs> oh, shit. I thought I was going to get eaten a couple oh, times. Oh, my God. But I have not been. Be nice. So then Migo goes into the kitchen. And he feeds the little dog they have. They have a little Jack Russell Terrier. Aww. It was a very cute dog. Uh, the, uh, he sets the plate of food down for the dog. The dog barks. Migo's like, hey, what? You don't want this? What do you want to eat instead? And then the dog barks again. And then he goes... <laughs> Say it. He says, Say it. you want Cajun food? No, shit. He says, you want Cajun food. Okay, because when he fucking said that, I was like, he thought of the dog eating Cajun food. What is Cajun food? It's pretty spicy. It's a little bit of French. It's from Louisiana. It's French, but it's very spicy. So it was like cooked frog legs with a lot of pepper and <laughs> things like that. A dog eating a frog leg. See, that's a, it's a good joke because then when you tell me what Cajun food is... And that's I, even funnier. The visual of eating a frog leg. Oh my god. He's like holding in his paws. <laughs> and then he says, I'm not giving you Cajun. We're still working on the time I gave you Kung Pao chicken. <laughs> and then uh, apparently they had a big mishap with that that we didn't get to see. But uh, I mean, I'm just speaking for myself here, but I wanted to see it. No, me too. Like, would it kill him to do a flashback to like lots of dog diarrhea all over the place? <laughs> No, I fucking totally agree. Like, I don't know. It may be kind of juvenile, but I think poop is pretty funny sometimes. It's a lot, but, you know, the fact is, in the end, a lot of funny visual stuff going on where they're giving us insight into the relationship that he has with the little puppy, and the dog poops and eats frog legs, and it's just pretty funny. I mean, there's a lot of there's good writing. <laughs> well, if anything, it's good writing. Oh my god, fucking genius, man. And the performance, yeah, what's one thing that's great, but the writing, oh my god. Yeah, I mean, should have been best comedy, best acting, best yes. everything. Should have won some <clears throat> Oscars, too. I mean, it was on TV, but... <laughs> no, I agree. The logic I use is, okay, Oscars on TV, TV shows on TV, therefore, TV shows should win Oscars, because they're both on TV. Exactly. Okay, I'm stepping off my box. Of Dial. Which we saw a commercial for. Yes. Because there was original commercials in the Mego episode we watched, which was fun. I like that. I do too. I really do. It really makes you nostalgic. Oh, I love it. Titular nostalgic. That's what we're all about. So then after the dog scene, Maggie comes home, who is Michelle Trachtenberg. And at this point, she's what? 13? 12 to 14. She's a tween. 12 to 14. We'll call it like it is. She's a tween. So she comes home, and she's got a note from a secret <clears throat> admirer. Oh, my God. The note says that he loves her womanly form, and she's very seductive, and a couple other things I can't remember. Part of the joke is she's w not exactly womanly not or at all. seductive. She's uh, basically, she's a tween. She has no development in the breast no region. No curves. She has no hips. She's got no curves. She's not a woman. And Migo says, in the hilarious way, oh my God. I mean, I forgot, but what did he say? Just hold your horses for a second. Okay, whew. She says, he says he loves my womanly form and that I'm seductive. Migo says, what? 
Do you share your locker with Michelle Pfeiffer? <laughs> oh my god. So he knows Michelle Pfeiffer. Oh my god. And the concept of popularity. But <laughs> doesn't he, know shiitake what mushrooms. He's giving people shiitake mushrooms. He doesn't know that people want candy on Halloween. What a twisted mind. Who thinks of this stuff? It's like the writers are like... They became an alien. They flew up in a spaceship in their imagination and looked down and said, well, how does an alien think about the world? Where do these guys even get these ideas? I don't know. I want to ask them. They must just be seeing things and then oh my God. twisting it around. Oh, my God. If only I could see the world through their eyes. What would you do? Hypothetically. Okay. Yeah. They make a contest. Where you get to sign up, and you get to win, and hang out with the guys who wrote this show. And oh, my God. And you get to God. ask them any questions that you feel like. Uh-huh. Oh, my God. What, do you, what would you ask them? My first question would probably be... Oh, my God. How... Oh, my God. ...much fun... Oh, my God. ...do you have... Oh, my God. ...just looking at anything? Oh, my God. Me, too. Huh. <gasps> That's unbelievable. Oh, my God. What else do you need to know? Like, they live in their own hilarious fucking world. crazy fucking cool guys. Okay, I'll... And then my second question would be is, how great is Bronson Pinchot to work with? Well, do you really need to ask that question, or can you just look at the other actors' faces when they're trying to not laugh when he's fucking saying shit? That's true. I mean, were, the blooper reel on this thing must have been... Oh, my God longer than the show itself. Well, I have a theory that, you know, if they release a DVD, it has to be on Blu-ray just to fit one episode's worth of bloopers. I have another theory on top of that that they got canceled because they ran so much tape because everyone kept cracking up. And that's why they got canceled. They spent too much money on tape. I mean, that that's the only logical thing I can think of. Logic. Logic and Mego go hand in hand. <laughs> Well, I mean, it's a wacky logic, but well, it's logic. Well, it's logic nonetheless. But here, I'll, I got one thing to say. What's to say that he, his point of view isn't as valid as a human? I hadn't thought of it like Nothing that. Nothing besides our own fucking ignorance and our own, you know? You know, Migo thinks outside the box yeah. because he's never been in the box. He never, yeah, he's never been in the box. He gets here and people are trying to put a fucking box on him. And he goes, I'm going to give you shiitake mushrooms in, in Dr. Scholl's. <laughs> <laughs> I keep thinking of, like, the kids walking away from the house, but, like, they look down in their box. And, and they're like, like what? What is what? And they're like, what'd you get? And you go, I got sh Dr. Scholl's. I, I got a Dr. Scholl's. And then I'm like, well, I, I got a shiitake mushroom. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh man. They should have shot that. I think whenever they make a joke in a show, especially this one, that if they refer to something that we have to use our mind for, I think it's more effective to shoot it all. And well, show, show us what it is, and then we can put it in our heads because we've yeah, seen it. I want to see it. I mean, I can just imagine how. <laughs> oh my god! How funny that is, but I mean, <laughs> I just want to see it because <clears throat> my imagination pales in comparison to these Miller yeah. Boyette guys' writing style. Mm -hmm. So I don't. I just can't. I don't have the mind they have, so I can't imagine their crazy fucking universe that they've built. That's why they owned Friday Night on ABC they for did. 10 years. Maggie asks Migo to uh, analyze the letter so she can find out who her secret admirer is. There's CGI letters floating around me. That was cool. And he's like, someone very smart, someone passionate, someone who has a thing for 12-year-olds. <laughs> so it's either a classmate of yours or Woody Allen. I love this guy. Oh, oh my god. He's the king of pop culture, apparently. <laughs> that is so fucking funny. Because it's cool, because this came out in 96? Seven. 1997, and that joke is literally, it couldn't be more fresh. It's like you just opened the wrapper on it. It's that no, fresh. Yeah. It's, it's just, like, this thing just happened. It was just made. It's oh, still warm from the factory. Like timeless humor. Within the span of about a minute... He hit Michelle Pfeiffer and Woody Allen. Bam, bam. You know, thing what an alien is, okay, he gets here, he he serves no one, okay? So he nothing's holy to this guy in our heroes like Michelle Pfeiffer and Allen. 
he gives it to him, you know? Yeah. No loyalty because, you know, he doesn't see the value in him because, you, you know, not, not brainwashed. Hey, he's... Nobody's safe. No. I think, actually, Matt Stone and Trey Parker took their ideals from Mego. Oh, completely. The yeah. whole idea of, yeah, yeah, yeah. They're just trying to take down everybody. Liberals, Republicans, oh, anyway. anyone. It doesn't matter if you don't make sense to Mego. It's time to go, okay? Because you're going to get slammed. Nice segue, because they went up to Tripp's room next, and you know what Tripp was doing? He was throwing wadded-up paper balls through his little hoop on his door playing basketball and he also had a tony kukoc poster and now i don't know who that is he was the third guy behind michael jordan and scotty pippen on chicago oh okay he was foreign i mean he was pretty good not in the hall of fame so he was um no reason to have a poster of him <laughs> frankly now, or okay he also had a jordan poster and a pippen poster but he didn't really see them as well you got perfect kukoc right in frame behind him but what about okay so wait kukoc not from america no, Kukoc is from uh, an Eastern European country. Well, let's think about it like this. He's sort of like an alien. Oh, So man. maybe they're like little subliminal, like, respecting the idea of being from another place. This guy, whoever directed this, yeah. is like Kubrick. Yes. He's putting you in, are right. He's putting in subtle themes that need to be categorically analyzed later, and that's what you and I are doing tonight. No, dude, that's what I'm saying. I mean... We're here, we're doing a service, we're not fucking off. Halloween be damned. We are not trick-or-treating because of this. No, and I remember we fucking planned to go trick-or-treating. I wanted to so bad. No, me too. Me too, man, but... We owe it to Migo. No, we owe it to Migo. We do, we owe it to these something like this that just got pushed under the fucking rug. But, you know... If Migo is pushing it somewhere, he'd fucking push it under the ceiling. Because he just doesn't know what he's doing. <clears throat> but he does. And that's the thing. Is he playing dumb? Or is he playing genius? Yeah, that's the thing. So Migo says, is your room clean? And Tripp's like, yeah, it is. And then Migo goes, okay, uh, then I guess you wouldn't mind me coming in. And so Migo comes in the door. He's fucking busts in there. And like he gets hit in the face of the paper ball. <laughs> and then he says, it looks like your closet power barfed all over the floor <laughs> oh shit and i mean i'm just speaking for me but power barfing is so funny it, no it's so fucking it's like funny. could you just picture a closet just going <laughs> and like all the clothes flying out <laughs> oh man no i can and i did but it's funny because you know i could imagine Migo using his powers to make the closet fucking barf oh he could so you think in a way he's speaking from like experience yeah maybe he did this in his own room and he one day he was just bored and he's like i'm gonna make my closet power barf that's so crazy so then <laughs> he tells trip to clean up so trip grabs something and he's opening his closet and then you see jonathan lipnicki in there oh my god Jonathan Lipnicki is on a green screen, so he's floating in the closet. Wait, they did that on a green screen? Yeah. It sucks, man. Sorry. This is like a moment where you find out Santa Claus doesn't exist. Yeah, it kind of is. I don't know, dude. I just thought, I don't know how they did it. Can I be honest? I kind of hope that he could really do that. Well, he can. He had wasted his power that morning already because he did a funny prank at craft service table oh. so he's only got a limited amount oh. of stuff he can do yeah okay yeah you feel better yeah okay so jonathan lipnicki's in the closet and he's floating over some fire and and he goes i'm hungry for human flesh and then his head spins all the way around it's crazy it's like hey exorcist meets the creepiest thing you can imagine. No, and that already was the creepiest thing. That's Exorcist Squared. It's Exorcist on steroids, if you ask me. Oh my god. Best way to describe something. Yeah, anything on steroids means it's way better at whatever its intent oh, yeah. is. And then Trip goes, meh, and shuts the door and goes, you're going to have to try harder than that. Migo has struck out twice now. I mean, more power to him. No, oh, yeah. He's still trying, and Trip's still giving it back. He's just, he's returning serve every time. Trip kind of looks at Migo and says, You tripping. He doesn't say that out loud, but I imagine that's kind of what he's thinking. I mean, it's just crazy. You know, Trip 
This is a space alien with unknown powers, and Trip does not give a fuck. That's the kind of confidence that I want. I'm just going to say that again. He's a role model we could use in, you know, these days. If you would have seen this show before you got to high school, how would Trip have affected oh you God, with ladies? I would have fucked so many fucking chicks, dude, because nothing would have phased me. And I'm not saying a lot of shit did phase me, okay? I think we all have a little bit of Trip in us. I'd like to, th I'd like to think so. If we don't have Trip in us, I don't really see the point in life anymore. Uh, yeah, that's insane. So then Migo goes downstairs, and he sees a skeleton sitting there. It's a decoration. I'm not trying to creep you guys out. It's a decoration creep inside the house. You're creeping me out. I'm in a graveyard. Well, I mean, hey. Tell me. Don't fucking talk to them. They're who, sitting in their home. Whose hand is that on your knee? <laughs> you know what? That scared me. A turnabout is fair play. <sighs> I'm not trip enough for this. You just have to find the inner trip in you, get through this night. I think you're right, I think you're right, I think you're right. Migo sees the skeleton decoration, and he walks by, and he goes, Hey, you look like Kate Moss. Maybe you should eat something. Oh and then puts a chip god. on its mouth. <laughs> oh my god. Bring, 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 bring. Let's ring in the tally here. We got Michelle Pfeiffer, Woody Allen, Kate Moss. <laughs> nailed them. Kate Moss is a little bit like Jesus, because she just got nailed. Imagine, if you will, that Migo was on TV during the Bush presidency. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. We wouldn't need fucking Daily Show or Colbert Report. Those guys wouldn't have jobs now. No. Well, you know, that, you know, I don't want to be conspiratorial, you know, or paranoid, but let's just say Migo was saying more than people thought that an alien from another planet should be saying, you know? He spoke to America for America, and for what America should be. No, I agree, because America is made up of uh, aliens, people from other places, and, you know, he's from another place, because the whole world's sort of been, uh, you know, it's been colonized, and he's from a frontier we can't imagine. I, some would call it the final frontier. You no, know, some would. i go to those people and be like, that's some good stuff. Hey, you know what else? I just made this up, but... <clears throat> You talking about America like that. Yeah. I think I would like to call it, um, hear me out. Okay. I think America is like a melting pot. Um, sort of like a bunch of different things put together and then they all, pot. they all become one thing. Yeah. I think I should workshop it a little no, bit No, no, no. I get, it's, yeah, I get what you're saying. It okay. makes, it makes sense. Melting pot things. Yeah. I'll try to streamline it just a little bit more. It's good, but I don't think it's... I don't think I could... I can't imagine other people saying that. You don't think it'll stick? No, I think it's more like, you know, Legos? Yeah. It's like someone took all the different colored Legos and, like, put them next to each other. Uh-huh. That's what it's like. Okay. See, that's just <laughs> so much simpler and more succinct than mine. <laughs> yeah. I'm good at that stuff. Would you read my screenplay and give me some notes on it? Yeah, okay. Okay, cool. It's actually a continuation of Migo's story. It's a, it's a. No way. Yeah, I don't know. I think, um, he, I think he might be into it. I don't want to get too excited, but does Trip make an appearance? Maybe. Okay, I'm excited to read your um, your, your screenplay. Let's just say, I'll just give you the tag right now. Okay. Trip, and Migo, go to college. Oh my God! Okay, <clears throat> you gotta tell me. Dorm? Oh, yeah. Me go in the dorm with Trip. Oh, yeah. Does Trip have, like, girls over sometimes? Sometimes. Oh, my God. He'll put, like, a sock on the door, and then Migo's like, Hey, you're supposed to put this in the hamper. Oh, and he walks in. <laughs> That's fucking funny. I know. Holy shit. I'm, like, the movie's flashing through my brain right now. The possibilities are endless. I mean, it just makes sense. That's so funny. The sock thing? Yeah. He wouldn't... You're right. He wouldn't understand that. It, he would He would think of it very logically. He'd be like, socks don't go there. Socks don't go on the door, and, buddy. And it's not trick-or-treat season, so I don't know why this is on the door. It's not a shiitake mushroom. That is so funny. I actually, I actually wrote that line in there, too, so... That's weird, man. Yeah, it's like a callback to this episode. <laughs> That's so weird. That's so cool, though, because it's like the universe. You're, you're not... 
you're not isolating it from its home. It's you know? one thing. It's like your Mego, the script is like Mego, where it brings, it doesn't conform, it, 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 it stays itself. It creates its own world, and it's always itself. It's always, that's such, that's a good message. I'm excited. You should be. I'll let you read it next week. Great. Awesome. I just have to print it out. I'm out of paper. Okay. So then Maggie comes out in a Poison Ivy costume, because we all know Batman was a big movie at the time. Oh, that's what that's from? Yeah. I thought she was dressed up as the plant. Did you really? Yeah, I did. It was... (laughs) I don't know. I just didn't remember that. He probably shouldn't have touched her then. That's what I was thinking. I was thinking if it was a really, like like realistic costume that she would put like itching powder on her oh man that would be so funny that'd be funny that actually would be if really Migo, funny if Migo if Migo did that I think he would do that oh yeah that's how Migo is is that how I said that is that oh, that's pretty cool that's how Migo is that seems like uh, what a neighbor character would say if the show lasted longer so would you like want to work a guy into your screenplay that's a neighbor or something like a funny guy uh, i don't know i could see a, maybe a guy across the hall in the dorm hey what's what's going on migo like he's kind of like a stoner guy and like a little maybe a little poly shore-ish you know what actually i should hey, call poly shore and get him in on this hey migo what's going on buddy i mean i know that you're just trying to help me out but yeah i think i'm gonna call poly shore on this poly shore yeah i think he's right for You'd it want, but what a I mean, you know, I can act, sort of. I'm not trying to, like, push myself in there. Well... I don't think... I just don't think Paul Shorten gives a fuck. You know, I think he's... Yeah, you're right. I should get Jake Busey. Listen. You don't go... You stick... You know, people you know should... I know Jake pretty well. He came to my uh, son's bar mitzvah. Well, I mean, isn't he sort of, like... A rapist or something? Am I making that up? He's a ra- he's a rapist. He raped uh, that person. No, he didn't do that. That yeah, was you. Yeah, the acquaintance rape. No, that wasn't rape. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, I'll call Polly or Jake, and then uh, I don't know. Maybe you can do some extra work or something. Yeah, okay. So she comes down as poison ivy, and you were kind of nervous about that because mm-hmm. it might be real poison ivy. Whew. But uh, <laughs> the real the real DC Comics nerds and film buffs would know it from Batman. I know about movies. She says the admirer, the secret admirer that wrote her the note is coming to the party as a guy from Men in Black, one of the agents from Men in Black. And Migo says, <laughs> I didn't really like that movie. Oh my god. They painted aliens as the bad guys. That's fucking funny. Did they? Well, most aliens were fine, except for the giant cockroach. I think Migo, yeah, that I was mean, confusing for me. There's good people and bad people. There's good aliens and bad aliens. Yeah. I think Migo just missed the point on this. It's weird that he missed the point on something. I mean, usually he's just dead on. He's usually good with the big picture concept. So, Mika didn't like Men in Black. And, I mean, it's his opinion. He's a, he's, It's an art form. He doesn't have to like it all. And then um, Libnicki comes in. Jonathan Libnicki, a.k.a. Alex. <laughs> he walks in and he goes, Migo, I need help with my fangs. And he's dressed as a vampire. And he, Migo's... Why, why do you need help? And then he holds up a little apple, and the fangs are stuck in the apple. Oh, my gag. So Alex tried to eat the apple with his fangs in. And, I mean, that's just so funny. It's it fucking cute, dude. Like, I mean, the kid didn't even know they weren't real when he put them in. He, that's so funny. He This show is just full of people who see the world in their own fucking way. Ed Bagley shows up for the first time in the episode. <laughs> Over halfway through the running time. And he's also dressed as a vampire. And then the dog comes in. The dog is also dressed as a vampire and has little teeth in it, little fangs. Oh my god, that's that was did you laugh at that part? Oh no, I laughed at the part coming up. Oh I mean it was funny, but I was like I was like, come on, you guys can do better than this. And then the dog shows its fangs and Migo says, Huh, you look like Janet Reno at the opera. <laughs> <laughs> ring, 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 ring. Hey, Janet Reno, you just got me goed. That's, I don't like that. Then Ed Begley and Lip Nicky and the dog all leave to go trick or treating together. And Migo says, Don't bite anything I wouldn't bite. <laughs> uh, Maggie's party's about to start, and kids start showing up, and about 15 kids 
knock on the door and then walk in single file and somehow they all got there at the exact same time because they just walk in like a train and guess what like maybe eight or nine out of the 15 are dressed as men in black agents that's so funny so she doesn't know which one her secret admirer is do you you know that do you think they saw the matrix wasn't out yet that's so weird do you think the matrix saw this of course it did. <clears throat> because that's like uh, Mr. Smith. Oh my God, the Wachowski stole this. Yeah, see, we're seeing. I think we're seeing that this was a, as you would call it, a melting pot, or as I would call it, a Lego. Uh, a pile of Legos. <laughs> a pile of Legos of different colors and denominations, you know, coming together, and then other people look in there and they go, "Oh, I like that. I like that. I like that. And I like that." So, so far we're up to Matt and Trey from South Park and the Wachowskis. I mean, what other people stole from this? I'm... Well, I mean, I guess maybe it's not stealing. That's too harsh of a word. Maybe it's just homages and twists on the franchise. Yeah, totally. So, she thinks it might be Scott, who is the secret admirer, because he's the hot guy, let's be honest. And turns out, he's pretty dumb. Yeah. Migo walks over to Scott, and... He says, oh, hey, are you thinking of something? And the guy goes, I'm trying to count my teeth with my tongue. (laughs) I've been trying to do it for two days. And, uh, man, I wish I had two tongues. What a fucking character. I don't understand how two tongues is going to help you count something. I don't know, because when he said that, I was like, you sure you want two tongues? Because I feel like that would make him even more confused. He'd need another brain to to count. (laughs) If he's having trouble with one tongue, you give him two, gonna need two brains. And then he's gonna say, oh, I need a third one. That's, you know, excess, you know? He'd probably talk funny with two tongues. Oh my, and he already talked fucking funny. Yeah, he sounded kind of like a stoner, even though he was like 12 years old. Hey man, I'm just trying to count my fucking, like, teeth, man, with, but man, I wish I had two tongues, man. So he's dumb, and all these kids are dressed up like men in black guys and Migo goes up to Michelle and goes huh didn't these guys see grumpy old men <laughs> in- implying that they should be dressed as Jack Lemon or something Trip comes down and he's like hey I'm pretty unique I don't have anything in common with these 12 year olds I'm gonna go to my own thing and he comes down and uh, guess what he's dressed as a men in black guy that's funny and it's like hey Trip he's not f- infallible he, he can make mistakes like the rest of us. He, he's an everyman. He is in every man. I like to think that when he did it, it was different. Well, I mean, he made it look good. Yes. Yeah, that's funny. I might uh, add a callback to that in my script, too. That would be so good to call back to Men in Black. I'd be calling back to Trip calling back to Men in Black. It's meta. God. That's so cool, dude. <laughs> so as Trip is about to go to his party... Migo says, hey, uh, can you take the garbage out on your way? And so he grabs the garbage, and guess what? Out of the garbage can comes an Antarian swamp troll that grabs him and pulls him in. Oh, yeah. So he's Trip is fully engulfed by an Antarian swamp demon pulled into a garbage can, and, hey, still not scared. Maybe, yeah, I think he'd hurt his head, though, don't you? I don't see how they could both fit in there, unless it's like a weird TARDIS situation where it's bigger on the inside than it is on the outside, and so uh, maybe so cool. So I love sci-fi, man. Maybe oh, I mean I, I don't want to say that the Boyette guys stole this, but maybe they took the TARDIS from Doctor Who a little bit. Yeah, maybe. I mean, just throwing it out there. Quid pro quo. Everyone's stealing from them. They take a little bit from something else. Well, I mean, let's give them a little bit off the top. Yeah, pizza pie. And they're like, bam. Oh, ho, ho, ho. secret, secret, secret. Oh. <laughs> the Interior Swamp Demon grabs him and he's not scared. He gets out and he's like, what's the big deal? You got to do better than an Antarian Swamp Demon. And then Migo's like, come on. And he walks back inside. Lip Nicky and Ed Begley Jr. and the dog come back. And he's got like a lot of candy, quote unquote, even though it's like a teeny, maybe head sized bucket. It weren't that much candy to me. And... Ed Begley Jr. says, you can eat three pieces a day. Lipnicki goes, but it'll take me forever. And then he goes, I'm going to help. 
you know, I thought that he said, that's why I'm going to hell. I thought that he meant like, because he said it's going to take forever. And I thought that he was saying, well, that's why I'm going to hell. Like, you know, his eternal stay in hell where he's going to eat the candy. I don't know why I thought that. But I guess when he set the precedence of the writing of being just so wacky and weird and out there, you know, you're going to mishear a word and think that. And I stand by that, I guess. Yeah, sometimes the writing like this goes over an audience's head and you just have to rewind it a few times and give it another shot and see if you can come back to it with uh, some fresh ears. Fucking confused and just whatever, man. And then Migo says, boy, if you did eat all that candy at once, you'd get a cavity the size of Pluto. (laughs) And while that's a hilarious and well-written joke, a, it's impossible to have a cavity the size of Pluto. Yeah. And B, it's probably actually better to eat the candy all at once because the exposure of your teeth to the candy will only be one time. And yeah. that would be mitigated by one brushing of the teeth instead of multiple ones where he may forget to brush his teeth before he goes to bed and then the thing stows overnight. And, you know, it's just. A, I completely agree. It's a dental nightmare, is really what I'm saying. Do you think uh, Migo brushes his teeth? I don't think so. I don't either. Is that why you don't brush your teeth because of Migo? Yes. Well, I want to know if Trip brushes his teeth. And then I'll think about brushing mine, too. We could find out. I guess we could write some letters. Or you could just write it into your screenplay, and then I'll take that as the fucking word. Hey, it's, it's gospel. It's like the New Testament. I have to assume that you're channeling Trip. Of course I am. Because you've taken on the task. I couldn't just make up something this brilliant. No. Sock on the door, man. That's fucking good. You're div- you were inspired by something divine. Yeah, trip. So then, Gordon, this kid we've never seen before, approaches Maggie, and uh, she's going on and on and on about how she likes this guy that's at the party dressed in the men in black suit. And turns out Gordon is actually in the men in black suit as well. And he, she's like, "Oh wow, do you know anything about this guy?" And he goes, "Huh." Yeah, it's kind of hard to hear between uh, swirly flushes. And so the guy's a bully, kind of a jerk. Yeah, that's that was funny to think about, too. Oh, wait a second. After the hilarious Pluto joke about the cavities, Ed Begley Jr., Lip Nicky, and the dog all go upstairs to never be seen again. Yeah, I like that. I don't know. what They didn't join the party. They just all left. Did you think about what they were doing upstairs, though? In my fantasy... They spread out all the candy on the mattress and then, like, did angels in it like they won the lottery. That's so fucking cool, dude. Yeah. Man, I didn't think that. I had no idea. My mind wouldn't let me go there. Were you just in a blank space up there, like Mr. Yeah. Cooper's second story? It kind of was. I just, I, I, my brain tried to say, where are they going? And then, yeah, it went to this black void. Hmm. I'm glad you said that, because now I have, like, yeah, it's like, oh, yeah. I mean, could you just picture L- Lip Nicky and Ed Begley just rolling around a candy? Like, how great that would be? They that just... is so, it's, like, funny, but it's also just, like, cool, man. Yeah, it's like, well, they're having fun. They're they're bonding. Do you, I, I really think that, although it's really understated, the connection between uh, Begley and Limp is just... <laughs> fucking beautiful yeah they had unparalleled chemistry oh, man. it's like they were real father and son yeah. no i i agree when he was when he'd hold him you could just see there's more there uh-huh. it is beautiful i mean i saw you cry a little bit i wasn't gonna say it but i mean it feels right okay. i mean we're in a safe space we're in a graveyard uh, okay we got fences surrounding us when called this a safe place well i mean we are kind of isolated here it, there's... it's safe if you're a um, fucking zombie or a spooky ghost or a head on a pike that's on the fence Ooh, I didn't think about that wait what oh you? I appreciate when you put images of, of Beg and Limp doing candy angels but I don't appreciate the images of a head on a fence that is like a yard away Migo goes up to Gordon, and he tells him to tell Maggie how he feels about her. And uh, he says, to get any woman, Gordon, all you have to do is say something like, 
Excuse me, aren't you a model? <laughs> I'm going to use this on Friday night. Oh, please do and tell me I want to fucking see the chick's face. When I go to the bar, which you know I do all the time. Yeah, yeah. I'm out of work at 5 o'clock on a Friday. Head down to my favorite watering hole. Oh, yeah. Find the finest babe in there. Turn up my trip switch. And I go, hey, aren't you a model? I mean, oh, dude, I'm I'm in, right? I'm yeah, dude. I'm pretty confident that it's probably gonna work, and I do. You gotta tell me if I'm off talking to a chick myself or something like that. You gotta wave your hand in the air, and you gotta tell me when you're gonna do it, and I'll come. I'll stand. I won't let her know that I'm that I know you, but I'm gonna look at her face. We gotta have like a secret code to show that we're gonna oh. do that. All right. Like, uh, cool. what do you think? Should we just like wave both our hands over our heads until, yes. we, until we get each other's attention and then go do it? That's a pretty good idea. I mean, it's subtle. It's not like yelling or anything. Yeah, I don't want to do any real sign language because yeah. What if she could read it? Ooh, then the secret is out, yeah. and I'm not, I'm not fucking around with the risk. I want to see a chick. I want to see a chick's face when you go. Excuse me, you're a model, right? Dude, I can just picture it now. She's going to be like, huh, what? Oh, my God. She's going to blush. She's going to beam <laughs> across the room into my car. And I'm going to have to get a ride with someone, but I'm going to be hey, I'm sorry. smiling myself. And, you know, if it works for you, then I might just myself try the line on a honey, you know? Oh, you got to get one of those fly honeys I've oh, heard about. No, you know it. I don't... Fuck around, not anymore. And this this line, this line made up my game to the uh, to the next level. Gordon goes up to Maggie and he strikes out again. That's zero for two. And then Migo goes up to a witch and he goes, "Huh, better to have loved and lost <laughs> than to never have loved at all." <laughs> so he knows some Shakespeare too. This guy's all over the place. Very interesting. Then uh, Maggie and me go talk, and she's like, man, I can't find the guy who wrote me this note. And then she has a realization that she spent the whole night talking to everyone but the right guy. Isn't that how it always is? Because Migo put it in her head, you know, hey, maybe that uh, the only guy that actually fits all those criteria is Gordon, and you didn't give him the time of day. So she realizes the error of her ways, and she's like, oh, I wish I could talk to him. And then, hey, you got Migo on your side. So cool, so cool. So he flashes up a wallet in his hand. It just appears. So neat. Earmuffs, digitally. They CGI it. Okay, you can take your head, you can listen again. So he pops this wallet up with his magic powers, and then it's Gordon's wallet. Because, you know, every 12-year-old has a wallet. That's so cool. Gordon comes back to the door, knock, knock, knock. Migo comes in and he's like, hey, uh, what's up? And he goes, oh, I forgot my... And he goes, you forget this? And he gives him his wallet. And he goes, hey, why are you here? Why don't you uh, talk to Maggie a little bit? So then he freezes them both. I have never knew he was capable of this, but Migo freezes them in time. That was neat. And he cranks something up on his watch or whatever he used to freeze them. I don't even know. I don't know either. I don't want to know. And then he tries to tell them that they both are like each other and they need to go for it. He says, I want you to take away all inhibition that you have in expressing how you feel about each other. And then he unfreezes them and Gordon goes, I want you, baby. And she goes, take me. And then they run to each other. And as they like embrace, Migo freezes them again and he goes, oh boy. Not quite that much, God. We need this to be G-rated. So then he hits his watch again. It reverses time. And then he cranks down his little watch again. Presses play. And then they are fine. They sit on the couch together and talk. And we don't hear them say anything. Well, he says, um, Gordon says, I'm the one that wrote that letter to you. And she goes, well, I'm cool or something. And then they sit down and... They have a pretty good time. You know, like two kids should. I'm not trying to ruin what the show created, but if he, Migo has the power to reverse time, couldn't he have just reversed time all the way back to when his spaceship broke? 
Um, I don't necessarily think it's important to uh, I mean, analyze it on that level. I don't want to throw around the word plot hole, but just saying. Um, you know, I suppose you're partially right. There's a hilarious tag on the end of the episode. Ed Begley Jr. and Lipnicki walk into Tripp's room, and Ed Begley goes, You gotta stop tricking your little brother. You're freaking him out. Why don't you try goofing on someone your own size? And then Tripp's like, Oh, okay, I guess, I mean, I'm having fun, so I don't really want to stop, but I guess I will. And then Ed Begley's like, Ooh, brr, my stomach. I have weird stomach cramps. And then earmuffs. CGI alien comes out and flies towards Trip. You can put that the... was so crazy. Yeah, that alien, that real alien that came out of Ed <clears throat> Begley Jr. That was insane. You think the aliens have uh, handlers on the set? Like, I'm sure they do. That's so neat. I mean, if a dog has to have a handler, like an alien that would burst out of Ed Begley's stomach would have to have a handler. I hope so. I mean, it was really cool. It was scary. So fucking cool. So green. I mean, Trip probably got really scared because he freaked out. He like flew back on his bed, and then you could see his second Tony Kukoc poster on the wall. That was neat. And I mean, hey, this guy must love Tony Kukoc because he has two posters in two different poses. And I actually thought they were the same poster for a second, but uh, they we, weren't. No, they weren't. We had to freeze frame and rewind it because I mean that alien was so cool and real. I wanted to see it again. So I also I took that opportunity to see the poster again. And uh, yeah, two different Tony Kukoc posters. Probably the only person in history to have two Tony Kukoc posters other than Tony, Tony Kukoc. Kukoc. <laughs> hey, guess what? It wasn't Ed Begley. It was Mego. That surprised me. That's what we got from Mego. I wouldn't say it's the greatest show I've ever seen, but it's definitely a top ten life-changing moment. It's a moment, yeah. To, to say that this is just a show is to... It's kind of demeaning. It is, because the show is simply a vessel for a, for an incredible collection of thoughts. Ow. What happens? I think I just got bit on the neck by something. You fucking doing jokes? I think there's two spots of blood on my neck. Okay, well, I'm gonna tell you something. I don't want you to get too scared, but that um means you got bit by a vampire. What? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We gotta get out of here, man. I, we can't. We okay. got this whole treat section of our podcast dude, left. Dude, dude, dude. I don't know, man. I just don't. If you become a vampire, I'm gonna have to fucking kill you. How? With a wooden axe or something. I forgot. I don't know. You know, just, just for your safety, I think it's a wooden steak. Okay. Maybe steak, should... whatever. I mean, feed me a steak. Okay, so I'll Get feed you a steak. 72 ounce sirloin, medium well. Hold on, I gotta write this down. 72 ounce sirloin, medium well, from Spago. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. You know, the, the chubby girl uh, from uh, Babes, she went oh. to Spago. She got the chef. You should call okay. her. Okay. She knows his phone number. And yeah. a di- Diet Coke. Diet Coke. Potato. Potato. Light on the butter, and some broccoli. Broccoli, see. Broccoli crowns. Yeah. And um. Okay. I'll go with one breadstick. I don't want a whole bucket. Just one breadstick. Okay. That's uh, that, that, sh- that should kill me when I turn into a vampire. I think if if that's what happened. I okay. Mean. Hopefully you don't eat it all, so uh, I can eat the leftovers. Oh um, wait. Uh, you might want to say uh, no garlic on that. Oh, I get it. Yeah, because I'm a vampire, probably. Extra garlic. <laughs> what was that? Nothing. <laughs> For the treat section, we have a little sitcom called Emerald. You may have heard it. Its pilot was made in 2000, but the show didn't technically start until September 25th, 2001. So technically, it still passes for Applied Nostalgia's strict guidelines. Yeah, so you can close your fucking mouth. I don't want to hear it. Don't write any email saying, uh, Emerald was actually on Foul 2001. Fucking ingrates. Yeah, they were working on the show, burning the midnight oil for over a year to make Emerald. And you can tell. So we watched Emerald, episode 108, entitled Halloween. Wow, that is such a fucking perfect title for a Halloween app. I know, it's kind of 
apt? Someone call it accurate. Someone call it apt because um, you got to be sure that Emerald's got a few recipes for some yummy, yum, yum apps. I mean, I know. I'm just speaking for myself, but I was hungry during this show. Oh, my God. You know, that is an issue. Don't start with delicious food and funny laughs because... I know I'm going to get laughs, but I can't eat my TV screen. This show is basically 30 Rock, but without anything funny or the chemistry or the talent, frankly. Oh, no talent at all. It was a sort of behind-the-scenes show of Emeril, because, you know, he's popular, he's a chef, he had a TV show, and this is him hanging around the office, him hanging around his house, but he's playing himself. So you see him on set... You see him getting ready for other shows. You see him going home. You see him spending time with his family. It stars Emeril. It stars Sherry Shepard. And Robert Urich was his boss slash fellow executive, whoever that guy was. He was um, a friend, I like to think of it. I, I didn't, yeah. And then two other women are also in it. One of them was in Sybil. And the other one I've never seen before. So, yeah, it stars those five people. And it's kind of a workplace comedy. Yeah, sort of. Well, it's like they have so much fun that you never get the sense that they're in a place of work. Their work is their family and their fun. I mean, that's why Emerald's so popular. He brings joy to everybody. I've always said this, but the way to a man's heart is through his stomach. Could not be more true. The show starts with Emerald at his show so meta it's a show within a show already he's at a show at his like table where all his ingredients and he's cooking food and he's berating the audience he's like this is too rich you're gonna say it's too rich and uh you're gonna need to go to a hotel and you're gonna need to order room service basically he just yells at the audience and says his food is great he just calls them fat but he's alleging that they're denying that they're fat it's kind of weird i don't know what that means but then he says stick around so uh, clearly it's not offending people it's he's kind of like an abusive dad he just like beats the shit out of you and then like but you know he likes you he loves you he's just stressed it's like the audience is uh judd nelson in breakfast club and emerald is his dad it was a banner year at the emerald household (laughs) i think he would say are we gonna be friends after this podcast um i don't remember what happens in breakfast club into the workplace where we see the three women and they're all standing behind a table and they have pumpkins there but they're not carving them they're just sitting there and they're on newspaper like they're going to carve them but they're not and the girls are talking about their costumes for the party that night one of them is going as genie for my dream of genie she says boring crap about how her mom didn't want her to dress like that when she was a kid that was really interesting but i don't remember any of it her mom made her wear a a windbreaker under her bikini top. And someone thought she was a homeless person. Yeah, it was so funny. Is that funny? I mean, I laughed really hard. I was offended. I think so. Why? Because you're a member of the windbreaker community? Okay, partially, but then also, what's funny about someone thinking you're homeless? I don't like... There's nothing funny about being homeless unless it's a funny homeless guy with a funny sign that says something like, We'll work for food. And he's like the four, <laughs> right? Yeah, it's the good. four backwards, and it's also a number. But otherwise, there's nothing that funny about just that idea of being homeless. But it's funny when a, a kid's homeless, right? Uh, yeah, okay. <laughs> I didn't think about that. <laughs> oh, shit. Like, yeah, like they get it's like, like, they grease should, on their face it, and messy hair. It's like they should be taken care of. And being a loving family, but oh they're homeless. God, that is fucking funny. It's like funny because it's different than how it should be. Okay, I it went over my head. I got. I mean, you got caught in the emotional problems yeah. with it, but I mean, I respect that you stick to your guns. But yeah, you know, sometimes, I do. Sometimes you got to be a little bit like Migo and think out of the box. You're right. Be a little bit of trip. Be a little bit of Migo. Trip with a dash of Migo. Bam. I like it. So the girl who was in Sybil says she's taking her daughter to a party and uh, there's going to be professional ghosts there. And then she says Sherry Shepard should go there. And Sherry Shepard goes, 
I won't go anywhere in a sheet. It's a, it's a rule I have. It's because she's black. Okay, I wasn't sure what that meant. Black people are afraid of uh, ghosts. I mean, it could be a Ku Klux Klan thing. You know thing. what? I think you're right. That was a funny joke, but that's just bringing up racism, and racism is never I funny. I don't like racism. It's disgusting. I'm just gonna. It's lazy. It's lazy. It's lazy. Everyone knows that racism is funny. Well, everyone knows that people aren't equal. <laughs> so then Emerald walks in. And he uh, walks up to those three girls talking about their costumes. And uh, he starts talking about the party and how he's going to dress up like Jimmy Buffett in a Hawaiian shirt. And what I noticed was he uses a lot of table actions. <laughs> he's putting his hands on the table. He's moving around, touching the table. He just doesn't know what to do with his hands. I assume that's why they put this giant table there in the middle of the office for some reason. Just because Emerald needs that to be able to be a semi competent conscious being yeah because he i think uh, to me emerald is a savant he he doesn't he's not like most humans uh, in a way he's not that different than Migo, except for he sees the world through the lens of what is like delicious yum 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 i went to the optometrist and they uh, gave me the little test the emerald version and they said yummy or yummier Oh, I want to go to your eye doctor. I ended up with perfect vision. Yes. And a killer recipe for pumpkin pie. <laughs> oh, you should share with a friend. Go to NBC.com slash Emerald and read the recipes. I like that they did that. That was at the end of the episode. They, um told us where we could get recipes from Emerald on their website. Come on, this is 2000. That's way... What's, that's using the internet in a way that nobody had even thought of at that point. If I want an Emerald recipe, I'm buying a book. Yeah, I'll buy a book made of something you, you may not uh, 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 remember. It's made out of something called paper. The uh, what? Exactly. So, yeah, I think they put that counter there in the office just so he could have something to be behind. So then he's behind his counter when he's at his meta show and he's behind the counter in his office and then in his little office where he's got his desk, he's behind a desk and then in his apartment later, he's behind a coffee table. So he's literally behind a table the entire episode except <laughs> for when he's walking from one counter to another. In a way though, people know him as a guy behind a piece of wood and I think it may be frightening for people in the first season to see their emerald you know outside of his natural habitat it's kind of like seeing a clown at McDonald's by this point we're only about three minutes into the show and he talks about how he's gonna be Jimmy Buffett when he changes one of the lyrics in a Buffett song in Margaritaville from something about a salt shaker and then instead of saying salt he says bam so he snuck in a bam under three minutes into the show, which I find pretty impressive. He Me too. He put his catchphrase that quick. Well, I mean, when we started watching it, I immediately was sort of on the edge of my seat. If you hadn't thought of when's the bam... I didn't think of it. So I didn't want to say it because I didn't want... Yeah, I didn't want to give you the disease I had of anticipating something that, that may not have happened. I don't know if there's a trademark on bam that the Food Network owns. The uh, anticipation is almost worse than whatever happens most oh, of the time. Completely. Oh, God. Speaking of Food Network, so the show is on, what, NBC? Yeah. And they said Food Network about six, seven times in it. They said, you're the number one star on the Food Network. That was a um weird. And, you know, say this is a show, you know, from the 80s, and they said that, I would have just figured that it was a generic fake station. But the Food Network's a real thing. And and I don't know why I said any of that. I mean, do they... Pointless. Does the Food Network fall under NBC's protocol? Or, or like, are they a subsidiary of NBC? Or They have to be. Like, it just doesn't make sense that they plug that so much. Was it a freshly launched network and they were trying to drive people to watch it? Maybe, you know, I like to think that maybe the two networks just probably figured that they could scratch each other's back and just cooperate so even if they're not they're owned by the same parent company i think they just saw an opportunity to get together and have some fun 
and NBC and the Food Network just, they were like, let's do something together. That's how I see it. That may be naive. So it's like a crossover episode, but a show. Yeah, it's new. It's, you know, this show broke a lot of ground. It's safe to say it's ahead of its time, and that's why it was canceled so quickly. They could not deal with any of the logistics of this show. Let's just say the dum-dums that were watching Uh, this were like, I ain't watch no Food Network. I'm on the NBC right now. I'm so, I'm confused. Why is Emerald at his household? Uh, Hey, honey, get in here. Hey, what's going on? What's Uh, going on, Emerald? Did you give me that drink first? Yeah, I got here. You got here, your beer. (laughs) Well, do you want to tell me what this uh, channel is? Um, okay, I think this is the Food Network. But it's got that little peacock thing down there. Well, you um, you know what? I don't understand that either. So I think we should turn this off and never watch TV again. <laughs> you better tell me what channel I'm watching. Okay, dear. You know what? I think we're watching the Food Network channel, and we should turn it to CBS. Oh, you know I love you, baby. End scene. As we displayed in that scene, what happened was NBC noticed that people were getting confused and then they decided they weren't going to watch either network because they were just, it was too much to handle. And this is right after, I don't want to bring it up, but this is right after September 11th, 2001. Whoa, too soon. I'm sorry, but it's important to understand that the the atmosphere of the time was already pretty confusing, and I don't think we needed people being confused about what channel they were watching. That's very true. Because the couple in that example, the guy, he's, he's not an, a bad guy, okay? He, he just, works hard. He, wor- he goes to work, and, and she's not perfect either, but she doesn't deserve to get hit. But we've got to remember that September 11th, created a, a lot of confusion for a lot of people in this country, and that's why he hit her like that. Things were topsy-turvy, and I don't approve of it. No, you know, I think they say, you know, this and that, and the terrorists win if we do that. Well, if um, something were to affect, you know, NBC or the Food Network, I gotta say, yeah, the terrorists, they had a degree of success if that were to happen. So we had to, they had to pull the plug right then and there, I mean, Emeril, he still had his food and his restaurants and his Food Network show. Absolutely. I mean, he was going to be fine, but sadly for us, we lost out on his sitcom. I just feel like I'm never going to get this window into Emeril's life again. And I don't know what my life would have been like if I would have had that window. I mean, you could have learned how to implement Emeril yeah, into your life. I was thinking, like, successful guy... He's a workaday schlub just like us. Just like me. Like, uh, he was a hero for a guy like me because he would use, you know, really bad grammar. Oh, yeah. And he was kind of ugly. Yeah. And And he didn't enunciate. Didn't enunciate. He was a little overweight, kind of balding. Balding. Ethnic. Yeah. I'm sorry. I shouldn't have. You know what? See, I got to learn to read the room. I bring up fucking 9-11, and then I say ethnic. I'm done with that tangent. So then, speaking of being overweight, the slimy boss shows up, Robert Urich. He wants Emerald to get lipo with him because he's dating a head nurse of a person who does plastic surgery. So that gives them free lipo for some reason. I don't, I don't think that would, but hey, who am I? I don't know anything about rich life. And to be fair... If I was Emerald, I would have taken a little bit more offense to that. <laughs> like, hey, this guy's coming into my office who's supposedly a friend of mine. And he goes, hey, you should get lipo. I'd be like, you know what, guy? You're probably fired from my show right now for calling me a fat piece of crap. Uh, hey, my friend, she does this operation. Uh, you want to get de uglified? You're fired. But Emerald, I didn't mean anything by it. I mean, it's free. Your wife's gonna enjoy it. You're fired. Get out of here, you piece of shit. You call me fat. I own a fucking network. Hey, listen, Emerald. Someday, your show's gonna get canceled. You're gonna come crawling back to me for your liposuction, baby. 
But none of that happened. Hey, you like eating a lot, right? Yeah. Well, this way you can eat anything you want, and then you can go get lipo and lose 20 pounds. 20 pounds? <laughs> Woo. And Emerald says, quote, Nora will notice. She'll reach for a love handle, and she won't find one, and she'll fall off the bed. <laughs> Which means not only does he have love handles, but they're structurally important to their marriage and her balance. Without That's... those, she's gone. She might break her neck if he gets lipo. I, for me, when I heard that, first of all, I laughed. Second of all, I thought, that's not a healthy relationship. She's kind of a chubby chaser then, I guess, oh maybe. God, she's a chubby bracer. I just don't understand the logistics of... Her needing to hold onto a love handle or else she's going to fall out of bed. Yeah, like I said, she's a chubby bracer. She braces herself on him. Like, is she, like, holding herself up by them? Or is she so poor at sitting in bed that she needs to grab onto him so she doesn't roll over and fall out? Or It makes no sense to me. Uh, for me, I just tried to think of it post-liposuction where the gag started. Because thinking of it the other way, I got all jumbled up and confused. But the thought of her reaching for it and then her hand <laughs> touching where there is no love handle and then falling off the bed, it's funny enough to just overlook that it kind of doesn't make any sense at all. No, not at all. But you it know, is funny, though. It's very funny that she fell. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I mean, she might have really hurt herself, and that's hilarious. Because he's skinnier than he used to be. It's funny. So then, cuts to commercial, cuts back to the show. Emerald's at his show again, doing another taping. He's berating the audience again about something else that I didn't care to write down because, frankly, I got really bored watching this. He just starts going, hey, you people want more food, right? Blah, blah, blah. And then the audience is like, yay, you're kind of mean to us, but we like it because we're Judd Nelson. <laughs> They are Judd Nelsons. So then the show's over, taping's over, an executive lady shows up who's from the Food Network, and she says, oh, you guys can't do certain things at the party this year, the Halloween party. You can't bob for limes and tequila, you can't wear bikinis, you can't do all this stuff that would be normal at a party, why, I guess. Why can't they? Are they, uh, they didn't, they weren't filming the party. Apparently, the party last year was so crazy that they need to have a nurse on staff now. I and don't... they were just being warned about it, because... Do you think that's what it's really like at the Food Network? I'd like to think so. Me too, because, in a way, because I have this established, when I watch Emerald now, I think my mind just jumps around and creates all these scenarios in involving this cast of characters. Well, they're also lifelike and three-dimensional. That How can you not do that? It, no, it's hard. It's like they live in my mind. They live their day-to-day -day life in my mind. I mean... Is that weird? Just think about Sherry Shepard. She doesn't go out wearing sheets. Yeah. I mean, that's so rich. It says so much about her and how she views herself. That's Dostoevsky-level. I mean, I feel like I just read... A thousand pages describing her life. Yeah, I, I don't need. I don't need a conversation in a bar with a drunk, unhappy married man. You know, I, I just need to know: Will you wear a sheet? That's all I need to know. And now I'm gonna go think about you for the rest of my life. Because that's how much information I just got out of you. Yeah, I'll, I'll fill in the blanks. Thank you very much. So you're not allowed to do stuff at this party. And they're not having hard alcohol at all. Uh, they can only have, like, wine and beer, I believe. And so the guys leave, Emeril and Robert Urich, and they go out to their... They say, oh, we'll be at the party later. They go get their lipo. And then the girls are, like, getting ready for the party and blah, blah, blah. They're at the party. One's dressed... The Sybil girl is dressed as Tina Turner. Sherry Shepard is dressed as Aretha Franklin, but she kept getting confused for other things because, you know... It's a race joke. What's better... Yeah, she's confused for another black woman from another black show, and there's nothing funnier than getting your costume mixed up, but they did it twice with the I Dream of Jeannie 
costume as a homeless person and this Sherry Shepard as Aretha Franklin. That's funny, because then... Oh, she was confused Wheezy from the Jeffersons, and then the other girl is dressed up as Jeannie. So they're at the party, and they're like, oh boy, this is fun, we're gonna do stuff, and then they drink from the Jeannie bottle, which has bourbon in it, and they're sneaking alcohol, and then they get on the counter, and they're gonna start, they start singing and whatnot. Cuts back to Emerald's house, him and Robert Urich show up, and they're all sore, because they got lipo. <laughs> Stupid guys. Weren't that funny? It was hilarious. But, hey, guess what? I wrote down, lipo hurts! Exclamation oh point. Oh my god. Because... Is it, that what you got from that scene, too? It hurts. I mean, I know I'm not going to go get lipo and then go to a party, because it hurts. No. This is allegorical. And categorically true. Oh, completely so it hurts like they get back and they're like ooh, ooh, and they don't look any skinnier by the way no i mean i know the swelling takes a while to go down for a normal outpatient procedure but uh they did they looked exactly the same except they had fake bandages around them and they acted like their stomachs hurt sort of i mean i don't think emerald's ever had a stomach ache well maybe from eating too much <laughs> hey i got a thing to say uh, an idea now, I've only seen one episode of this show, but do you think that it's like Seinfeld with the dialogue he has with the audience applies to the theme of each episode? I couldn't tell you, because I was honestly so bored by his monologues that I didn't connect it to anything. Well, I don't know, because he's talking about eating a lot of food and how people, they're decadent. He talks about like decadence, like the thing about people eating both meals of the room service and then using both sets of silverware so people can't tell that it was just one person. But I think maybe that's how it is. I can see that. And that's... I mean, they're just saying that sometimes your reach exceeds your grasp. Yeah, sometimes, sometimes your eyes are bigger than your mouth. Stomach. Whatever. <laughs> I don't care. <laughs> Not to get crass here, but do you swallow a dick? <laughs> you think a woman's never seen a dick and thought that she could suck it, and her eyes were then bigger than her mouth because it was too big. I concede this point. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so then it's, uh, Emerald and Robert Urich are still hurting, and they sit down on a couch and chair, and then the door rings, and there's trick-or-treaters there, and then they go, oh, trick-or-treaters. <laughs> and then they get up. That's smart. So it's like, hey, let those kids go to another house. Like, you're in New York City. There's a million places to go. But they get up and hand out candy apples, I think it was, or toffee apples, caramel apples, something like that. It was apples of some sort. Can you imagine if they <laughs> fucking gave people shiitake mushrooms and insoles? <laughs> 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 My stomach in stitches right now. I feel like Emerald. No, oh, oh my god. So they say, oh, my wife's going to notice the marker marks on my stomach. And they go, oh, we can just go get gasoline to get it off. And then uh, Emerald goes, oh, where are we going to get gasoline from? We're in a city. And then you had a problem with that. Yeah, I said, um, cities have gas. And they do. But it is harder to find. There's not a gas station on every corner like in uh, our neck of the woods up here. You know what? Then I don't want to go there because I like getting gas. Well, I always eat Mexican food. They uh, give the kids apples or whatever and then sit back down. And then it comes back to the party. The people were having fun. And the standards and practices lady from the Food Network is there with the nurse. And they go, is that bourbon? And the girls are like, no, this is just a genie bottle. All I see is a couch in there. That's funny. They notice Emerald's not at the party. At this point, we're about 15 minutes in, and I said, I think I'm starting to get Stockholm Syndrome laughs from the show. So I, I literally started laughing at everything because it was so bad that I couldn't take it anymore. It became kind of funny. It's like, you know, you don't want it to hurt you, so you laugh. It's kind of like Jed Nelson and his dad. Well, he's a fucking... Banner year at the fucking Judd Nelson household this year. I got a pack of fucking Marlboro Lights and a case of Christ Krispies. 
Christ Krispies? <laughs> yeah. Is that a Southern Church brand? Yeah, it's like the communion cakes, you know? But it's breakfast cereal? But breakfast cereal. They just made it easier and more fun to eat God. Enjoy the body of Christ. Now with seven essential vitamins and minerals. Part of this balanced breakfast. Mmm, that's some good Christ! And you have to drink wine with it in the morning. I have no problem with drinking in the morning. My commute's like four hours, man. I was laughing at them doing anything because it just was so horrible. I was just losing my mind a little bit. And so then Emeril and Robert Yurik are like, Oh my god, my stomach hurts. Let's call the nurse. And Yurik's like, Oh, my girlfriend's gone. She's not answering. Well, let's call the nurse from the Food Network. So then the executive and the uh, nurse show up at Emerald's house, and they start cuddling up to him. They get in there, they sit on the couch, and everyone's chilling out. The nurse is kind of having a crush on Robert Urich, and the other girl's kind of rubbing on Emerald because he's the number one star of the Food Network, and they're just all kind of like, hey, uh, things are getting weird. <laughs> so then the three other girls who are sad that Emerald's not at the party because they love him so much. Were they sad? They were very sad, as we'll find out soon enough. They show up at his house, sneak around, stand up, look through the kitchen window, and Sherry Shepard goes, I'll never see anything again. Because she saw Emerald and Robert Yurick on the couch with these two gargoyles. Funny image. For Halloween, these two gargoyles. One of them wasn't exactly a looker, if you know what I'm saying. You might want to be careful who you're calling a gargoyle, because um, I saw some gargoyles right in the very graveyard that we're in right now. What? Were they, like, the live ones, or...? Um, yes. Oh, jeez. Well, I mean, they're alive right now. It's fucking Halloween. There's a moon... There's a dark, there's a wind, there's a howl, there's a cat. Jesus Christ, be more aware of your surroundings. I guess I gotta read the graveyard first. Yeah, please. Get the get the graveyard times. I'll check the, uh, the temp of the graveyard. Huh, looks like below body temperature, you know what I'm saying? Oh, you Cause be... Because there's corpses around. I get your humor. So the girls show up and they say they're never going to see anything again. And then... Hey, Magic of Emerald Show, where nothing gets resolved and nothing happens, cuts to the standards and practices, executive lady, and the nurse. They're gone. The three girls are in Emerald's house. You know what that's like? It's like on a cooking show when he prepares a dish, and then instead of watching him put it in the oven and waiting for it to cook, they have one already cooked that they did the night before. That is genius. It's pretty smart. I think Emerald brought his philosophy to the show. You think he was in the writer's room and he was just like, hey, you know what? Don't even finish that idea because we already got one right here. No, of course. He's like, no, you know, in Emerald, he doesn't say a lot. You know, he doesn't have a lot of dialogue. But when he does, it is um, analogous to that moment when he's cooking and he goes, bam! You know, he adds the bam. And everyone else is just like, all the, you know, the structural, the flour, and the other ingredients. But he is the spice. Yeah, the the edits in this, the weird jarring edits are kind of like bams in themselves. Oh, they are. It's like, you know, you're always on edge. He probably likens it to, you know, nobody wants to see how a sausage is made. No. And he's not in him showing the process of resolving or explaining something to, you know, between people is like watching a sausage get filled. I just put it on a roll, put a little bit of relish, and then I'm good with that, okay? Yeah, I don't need the backstory here. Yeah, and Emerald gets that. Cut out the middleman, cut out the middle of the story, and the end of the story. I just want to see the funny. Cut, Cut the sausage, twist the end, and we're on a roll. I just want the yummy, and I want the funny. Yeah, funny and the yummy. And Emerald, he gets it. It's like he's an average fucking guy like me. Emerald probably walked in the writer's room, and some guy's probably trying to write third act, and he's like, "Hey, what am I, Upton Sinclair? Hey. Just give me the sausage already." He, yeah, he, yeah, he loved referencing Upton Sinclair. Yeah, because he's clearly that kind of guy. No, oh, yeah, he he read it all. It's not like Emerald's ignorant. He 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 has all the knowledge, but he just decides he 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 reads it and he goes, "Not yummy." 
That's kind of like his mantra. Not yummy. Um, hey, Emerald, we got a we got a new uh, script for you. Here, here's a. It's thirty six pages this week. Okay, let me check this out. Okay. Okay. Um, ah, no, not yummy. But did you see when uh, you apologized to your wife and oh, then uh-huh. sh- you go through that whole process right. of learning about right. your things right. that you did wrong? Okay. Well, um, I got one thing to say. Does uh, does a pizza have a third act? Uh, I, no, I, I guess not. No. No, no. It's got um crust, uh, sauce, and toppings. Okay, I don't know how that relates to Axe, but intuitively, bam! But, you know, your character should learn from your mistakes. It's a recipe, buddy. We'll see what happens at the end. If the crust is good and buttery, and the toppings are good, and the cheese is melty, and it's good, I learned, okay? Uh, And I'll be able to recook that situation, okay? Okay, okay, Emeril, you you got it, boss. So, So, bam! Get on thank, out thank, of here. You, thank you, Emerald. Go thank back you. back to your room. Hey, hey, guys, let's, uh, let's rerun the script over here. And scene. Then uh, the girls show up, and they're in the house, and they find out about the lipo. And then, because it's Halloween, they all sit around on the couch and chairs, and they tell some spooky stories. Oh, my God. If, uh, should we talk about this right now in the graveyard? I don't know. I mean, if we talk about spooky stories, then spooky stuff might happen, so maybe we shouldn't. I don't know. But, I well, mean, let's just try it. They mentioned a co- couple of the old urban legends about, like, you know, the the prom queen that they pick up on the side of the road, and he gives her his jacket, and then it's on the grave. Oh, my God, there's a jacket over there. Okay, um, um, holy shit, I don't, I don't want to say things in words, because maybe it, it can understand words, and then it will make it happen more. Uh, I'm going to wave my hands in the air. Like you just don't care? No, but they don't think I don't care about my life. I'm going to wave my hands in the air like I care a lot. I care. I care. I care. So, I care. So these guys are... Uh, okay, he's going away. He's going away. Okay, we're good. Um, yeah, I'm glad the jacket just floated away like that. It, that's not creepy. No. Well, it's, yeah, it's a windbreaker. Is that wind homeless? No, that's a joke. So these guys are, uh, I mean, they're not like us. These these guys are scared over here. Like, Emerald and Robert Yurik are scared. Like, not like us. Uh, no. Um, they they decide to uh, share the couch together and kind of cuddle up because they're nervous, you know? Yeah, 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 yeah. And then... Uh, it's all noise. And then uh, they start drinking from the genie bottle because the girl left it there. So not only did those girls just appear in the house, but they also just disappeared with no reason. And they're just gone after those ghost stories. So they start drinking from the genie bottle that she left, and they don't know what it is. And I'm just going to say that a professional chef <laughs> should probably know what bourbon tastes like. I was thinking that. He seems kind of ignorant about a lot of things. I mean, that's like a cook not knowing what pork is. Yeah. Hey, uh, I'm a cook, but I don't know what flour is. Hey, I'm a cook, but um, what's this fucking box? That uh, with a door and these fucking things that get hot on the top. I'm just real confused. But uh, yeah, I'm a chef. I mean, I did go to Le Cordon Bleu, but can uh, somebody tell me what um this s- spoony thing is that has like s- holes in it? Oh uh, yeah, see, uh, I'm with this guy. I'm a chef uh, also. Went to um that culinary institute of uh, uh, Toronto, and I'm confused. Yeah, what's that? Uh, the stick. The uh, stick with the um, with the uh, uh, the prongs on it. Oh uh, hey, I went to New York University uh, Chef Division. Oh, oh, a real fancy guy. Um, I was uh, I was just wondering, uh, what what do you call it when you like hit an egg a lot of times and then make it do something else? Oh, uh, Mr. Smart Guy. Uh, hey, I went to University of Phoenix Online. I was just wondering, can you deep fry hot pockets? I like this guy. He went to Phoenix. And, you know, intuitively, yeah, you can. And it's so good. So, yeah, I don't know. They should know what bourbon is. It just doesn't make sense. It's just a basic ingredient. Hey, maybe Emerald doesn't drink and he's... Well, I mean, he... Well, maybe he only drank because he was scared. And he's, yeah. he's only read bourbon and, like, added it to things, but he's never actually tried it. So he just knows what the end result would be, like, when you cook it off. That's hopefully the case. Or he's a fraud. It's like when you mispronounce a word that you've only read and you've never said out loud before. Maybe he's just like, oh, I put bourbon in my recipes, but I never actually tried bourbon. 
So I'll just give him the benefit of the doubt because, I mean, he is that good. I'm going to... Yeah. Me too. Because I like the guy and I like his spaghetti sauce. The two guys are cuddling up, warm with bourbon on the couch, and Emerald starts singing Jimmy Buffett. And he ends the episode with a little thing called a bam. I like that. I just felt like I'd eaten at an Emerald restaurant, and the guy force-fed me one of the funniest steaks I've ever had. So then it tells you to go to NBC.com for recipes that they mentioned in the show, which I'm not quite sure they did mention, but... I don't think they did. Maybe uh, implicitly. And, you know, the one recipe that I'd like to get is how to be more like Emerald and like kind of tolerant like Emerald and kind of a good friend like Emerald and kind of like daring like Emerald. Well, that's just something you have to learn for yourself. Keep going to therapy. Fuck you. <laughs> this was like having the funniest steak ever, so... Oh, yeah. I just gotta ask you, uh, my neck's starting to feel kind of weird. Do, do you have uh, any information on that steak that I ordered? Or? Um, let me call the guy up. Beep, 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 beep. Hello? Uh, hey, buddy, what's cracking? You know, I ordered that, uh, steak with extra garlic. Oh, yeah, yeah, I got that. How's that coming along there? Uh, we got it cooking. We got it, uh, we got it on the way to you right now. Guy's in the truck, and, uh, he's, he should be heading your way. to the graveyard, where I said? I mean, yeah, it's kind of an unconventional place to bring a steak to, Hey, listen, you cook, okay? You don't know about places. You know about spices. So I'll see ya. Hey, uh, I got one question for you. Yeah. Can you tell me what bourbon tastes like? Because I ain't never seen this hey, before. Hey, buddy. I'm not... Okay. It's kind of like, you ever had, like, a piece of wood in your mouth? I can say that I have. Good. Uh, how about you shove it up your ass? Click. Hey, Tony. <laughs> hey, what? You spit on that steak. Take oh. the garlic off of it. This guy's an asshole. Okay, cool. <laughs> Okay, garlic free. Yeah, so what'd you say about that steak? Oh, um, oh, here's the guy here. I heard his door opening. Hey, dude, what's up? Oh, not too much. You didn't think. Hey, thanks, dude. I don't know. Am I supposed to tip? No, no, he's gone. Ah, right, here you go, man. Oh, cool. Try uh, that out. Let me just cut this up really quick. That. How's that? It's pretty good. Yeah, you know what? Uh, I'm feeling pretty good right now. Feel good? You feel uh, you feel good? Yeah, I got this uh, the iron. You know, it's kind of coursing through my veins. Yeah. It's, uh, oh, yeah, interesting. Kind of digging this uh, blood take, taste. Uh, take, uh, take another bite. Okay. The, you know. Yeah, this this blood's really doing something for me. It's kind of iron rich and you pretty know, good. You like feeling strong? Yeah. Okay. Uh, take a more bite to that. Uh, yeah. Um, okay, cool. Yeah, I don't know. I think this might be the best thing I've ever eaten. I mean, my neck doesn't really hurt anymore, and I'm just like, you know, I'm just, I really, I kind of want more. Want uh, more steak, huh? Uh, uh, you know, I'll call them up. I wait, <laughs> hey, uh, wait, hold up. Uh, uh, you, uh. Oh, you're full. Okay, okay. okay. Um, That's cool. I, uh, I, I gotta go, you know, uh. I wouldn't say I'm quite full, but, uh. Fun now recording this. Maybe uh, I could, uh, come over to your house uh, for a late night bite. You know what? Uh, my wife, uh, she's. Real light sleeper. <laughs> I mean, I could always come up and share the bed with you two. Hey, listen. Listen, listen, listen. It's a twin bed. Yeah. You gotta go, go to your own house. You're tired. Okay. You got bit by a bug. Yeah, yeah, you know what? I still do feel a little weird. My head's kind of swirling around. Like, all I can think about is, like, uh, how delicious would it be to, like, just sink my teeth into your neck? Yeah, cool. Okay, well, um, let's go, man. Well, I gotta go, so... Yeah, so I guess that's it for the trick or treat episode of Applied Nostalgia. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. I'm gonna deal with this neck thing, and oh my god, a zombie's coming after Evan! <laughs> <laughs> oh my god, let me get a piece of that. I mean, let me save you. No! Oh no, he's gone. I'm a ghost. <gasps> ah. Can he move things? Can he move like that weird sharp stick over there? <laughs> I'm a ghost too. Oh yeah. So that was it. Yeah, we're both ghosts. Happy Halloween. See you later. Bye.
This has been a So Well Read production. So Well Read?